Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, shalom to you. I bring you greetings from my house to yours, from the house of my father. And those within this house, most certainly, the ancients, the elders, the angels. <clears throat> my name is Gary Jean-Baptiste. I am a follower, disciple, and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach. I am honored and humbled to also say that I am a son and friend of the Most High God of Israel, the Eternal One, the Ancient One, the Holy One of Israel, the Father of Lights, the Father of Glory, the Father of Spirits. Yahweh is His name, and unto Him be all praise, all glory, all majesty, all dominion, all thanksgiving, all worship, both now and forevermore. I'm not afraid and ashamed to say that He is my best friend, <clears throat> and He is my Ishi, and I, am, I love Him, and I am in love with Him, for we are one. Praise the Lord. And so this is, of course, Dominion Gate Ministries. And the matter for this ministry and for this house is to raise babes in Christ, two sons of Yahweh. Those are my commissioning instructions from the Lord himself and ultimately my father. And so what I want to talk about here is something that has been placed upon my heart by Yahweh, which is continuing somewhat on a theme that I've spoken on here and there throughout the last two, two years. And that is the... The primary context from which I have brought this, it's, it's, it's in following the same theme, with the, but one of the primary points of this theme was in regards to the failure holistically of the fivefold and the rest of the development that we find and that Yahweh finds his house in by reason of the failure of the fivefold. And part of that failure is the, one, of the, one of the aspects of that failure is what I want to discuss here. It's, a, it's along the same lines and along the same theme, but I have not addressed it in this way that I am led to address it. And then, of course, by the title, is in regards to the wide chasm that exists amongst those in the body of Christ. And that chasm is a very distinct chasm between two groups of people, which I will get to in, 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 in Hashari, Sifantur, Ishamandar, Sifantur, Hallelujah, which I will get to momentarily here. After I pray, of course. So there is a wide chasm that exists between two groups of people that exist in the body of Christ. And that lends to the failure, holistically, of the fivefold. And why Yahweh has moved on from it. Though it functions, don't get me wrong. Though the grace is still there. The emphasis of Yahweh is not the fivefold. I hope you know, as much as, as, much as prophecy and prophetic ministry is being exalted and, and idolized. In the last several years, in the last in the last decade, I hope you know, brothers and sisters, that the emphasis of Yahweh is not the fivefold, and particularly is not the prophetic ministry. Hope you know, and I said it before, but I'm saying it again. Yahweh's emphasis in this dispensation of time is not the fivefold. And ironically, his emphasis you will find. When, he, when the Apostle Paul, not, intent, not coincidentally so, makes reference to the fivefold in Ephesians 4. One of, one, of the, one of the criteria and the job descriptions of the fivefold is what Yahweh is emphasis on right now. Because the, the fivefold has failed it. In terms of raising individuals, people, to be called to reach the fullness of the stature, of the, the fullness of measure of the stature of Christ. In other words, to become sons. Yahweh's desire is for his children to become sons, not to, be, not to remain children. And the, that in, the, the indictment concerning that failure rests on the shoulders of the fivefold officers. Which I've said many times, well, several times in the last two years. However, though, I have not addressed it within this context of this wide chasm. I have in passing and here and there, but not in this particular kind of way that I'm led to address here. And so I will do so. Hallelujah. After I pray, of course. Father, I honor you. I honor your children. It is an honor to be before you, and it is most certainly an honor to be before your children, Father. I don't take it lightly that you've authorized me to speak on your behalf to your people, Father. Let it never be an occasion or a time we're in or whereby I take this position, this opportunity, this authorization, this um, ordination for granted, wherein I extort, I exploit, mistreat, mislead, 
deceive, corrupt, defile your people, Father. Have mercy and keep me. Hmm. Father, of course, I'm asking that those who would come across this broadcast, their eyes, their ears, and their hearts would be open to receive what I have to say on your behalf as it relates to the very unfortunate wide chasm that exists that exists in your in the body of your dear son and in your house father that is caused that is one of the primary um culprits and reasons for the the arrested development that you find your house in father and so as i do this i uh, this exhortation that those who are honest those who are humble those who have a, a little bit of self-awareness in them can be and self introspection can look inward, and if they know they're guilty of this, of perpetuating this chasm that exists, that they themselves will repent. These leaders that are humble enough, self aware enough to acknowledge that they have perpetuated and contributed, not only contributed to the chasm, but are perpetuating it, that they will repent and get on your program of what you're doing in this modern day time, Father, that you are no longer. Emphasizing the five foot ministry, but rather you are emphasizing the era of autonomous empowerment, where you are you are raising leaders who will not secure themselves or procure themselves or garner themselves fans, followers, cult cultists, and idolaters, fans, followers, and cultists, but rather disciples. Well, they will raise to become sons, not cultists. Following cult leaders. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> so. Thank you in advance for utterance, Father, that all that I say will be said with succinctness, with clarity, with sound of speech, the authority you've given me as your son and as your oracle. Be thou now glorified. Nor the name that you pray. With the name of your dear son, Yeshua, HaMashiach, and the souls you've written, as you've spoken, as you've ordained, as you've sent for me to release, to speak, and to dispense. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I would say I can drop the mic right there, but of course that would not be in accordance to my obedience. So, again, repeating here. There is a wide chasm that exists within the body of Christ between two groups of people, brothers and sisters. And if you are if you are discerning at all, you know exactly the two groups of people that I'm referring to here. So, again, I'm repeating myself as an introductory to this exhortation that there is a wide chasm that does indeed exist between two groups of people, and this chasm has existed for a very long time. And it is it is not only existed, but it has actually gotten wider, which is why I've been led to address it once again publicly. Now, what is a chasm? For definition of terms, a chasm, thank you, Lord, is by definition a profound so the, the 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 there is a literal meaning, literal meaning, and there's a figurative meaning. And the figurative meaning is the one of pertinence here, of course. But the literal meaning, firstly, is a very deep crack in a rock, earth or ice. A chasm is a very deep, very deep crack in a rock, an earth, or in a ch or 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 ice. I want to say that again. The literal definition of a chasm is a very deep rock, sorry, a very deep crack in a rock, in earth. No, not in a rock like this, but a, in rock, in the earth, or in ice, right? That is what that means. That is the literal definition. But the figurative definition is as follows here, which again, as I'm saying, is the most pertinent one. A profound, profound key a profound difference between what and whom between people viewpoints or feelings see that again the, ch the, the, the the figurative definition of a chasm is a profound difference between people viewpoints and feelings a chasm figuratively speaking by definition is a profound difference between people viewpoints and feelings praise the lord now, the, so the groups of people that I'm referring to, without further delay, <laughs> the two groups of people that I'm referring to within this context is between what is modernly called, in many circles, the laity 
and the, the um, sorry, the clergy and the laity. The, 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 the chasm, the wide, very wide chasm that exists in the two group of people that I'm referring to here is, between, the, the, sorry, the two group of people that I'm referring to, let, let, let me repeat that. <laughs> the, the two group of people that I'm referring to that, that exists a very large chasm, repeating myself, is between the, the clergy and the laity. Now, for those who are unaware, just because something is widely known doesn't mean that it should not be said, particularly in regards to teaching. Now, this is not necessarily a teaching, as it is, again, as an exhortation and somewhat of an admission, admonition as well, right? So, for the definition of terms, what is the clergy? The clergy, by definition, are a body of people ordained for religious duties. They're ordained for religious duties, especially within the Christian church. For the definition continuing, the religious leaders whose job is serving the needs of their, notice there, serving the needs of the religion and its members. Some of the titles that, that those of this, those of this, those of this, those of this designation would hold would be priests, ministers, rabbis, etc. The meaning of clergy is a group ordained to perform pastoral or sacerdotal functions in a Christian church. Praise the Lord. Last part of this definition. I'm just I'm having all this to make it very clear here. Um, oh, that's 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 it. So the that is the clergy, of course, the leadership in the body of Christ. Plainly said, plainly put, right? Now, what is the laity? Of course, the laity are considered lay members or lay people who, that are distinct from the clergy. <clears throat> Remember what I said in terms of chasm, right? A, prof a profound difference, right? between people, right? A profound difference. Not a subtle one, a profound one. That is a chasm, right? So, <clears throat> there's a wide chasm that exists, erroneously so, and detrimentally, detrimentally so, between clergy and laity. Now, what is a laity to close off this part here? Of course, lay people, as distinct from the clergy. And it says, it's, the definition is ordinary people. That's, this is the problem here. This is the definition, you know. <laughs> the definition in itself provides the issue or the detriment. So, ordinary people, it's called. As distinct from professionals or experts. The ordinary people who are involved with a church, but who do not hold official religious positions. Notice what it says there. Ordinary people. This is the problem. In, in the definition itself, you find the issue. You find the, the, the indictment and the detriment. In the definition alone raises the issue here. They, they're identified by definition, a laity are, as ordinary people who are involved in the church but do not hold official religious positions. The clergy and the laity are both, so the, they are often called common people <clears throat> or what someone who I what someone who I love says commoners <clears throat> they're considered the commoners <clears throat> they're considered commoners but that's the issue in the definition alone alludes to the issue here in the definition alone before I even get to scriptures alludes to the issue here and to the Lord's displeasure and to Yahweh's disheartenment. <clears throat> and not only disheartenment, but displeasure and anger. There is a wide chasm that exists between those in leadership and those who are, uh, those who are quote unquote, being discipled because they're not being discipled. <coughs> There's a very wide chasm that exists between those of the clergy and those of the laity. That is inordinate. Now, for balancing, before I get to the scriptures, I want to establish the point that those, particularly within the context of a local assembly, because there are those, there are many Jezebels online. Again, Jezebels online, I'm telling you, man. You're always going to begin to deal with them, but nevertheless... <clears throat> 
There are Jezebels who are in line who are using the the who are using the very real truth in regards to religious infrastructures that have been established over long periods of time as far as traditions of men. There are, they do exist within local churches, most certainly. That does not negate the importance of assembling together. And that's where nefariousness, and, and, and this is where the, the adversary is very clever and very cunning. He will use certain truth, he will use a truth to establish a lie. Much like he did with, um, at the Garden of Eden. He, he, there's a truth that he said, but it's a truth that was meant to engender a lie or engender disobedience. It is the same serpent's tongue. So what many Jezebels online are doing are coming against the religious church, we, the religious infrastructure of the church. There is indeed one, but they're using that falsehood or they're using that, that religious infrastructure as faulty as it is to lend credence to their rebellion, to lend credence to their, their desire to not to speak against going to local assemblies. And to, to, specifically, they, what they want to do <laughs> is negate the, the need for submission. Because again, Jezebels do not want to submit to male headship. Jezebels hate male headship and they hate submission. So whatever way they can use to negate that ordinance, they will do so. And if they have to use the very real truth of the fault of the of the religious infrastructures that are false, that have been erected in in in, in modern day Christianity to, to do so, they will do it. Now their serpent's tongue and their 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 their, their nefarious agenda does not negate the truth of the real fact of the religious, the religious infrastructure that has been erected and that has been perpetuated for a very long time. And this particular chasm is part of that. Well, many believe that they're, 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 many believe that their scroll, their ordination, simply to sit in a pew, go to church once a week, and go home. They don't have to do anything. They just have to come and sit in their seat, listen to the sermon, listen to the man on the rostrum and preach, and go home. And no, you know, brothers and sisters, that this kind of format, in terms of a speaker on a on the podium, was implemented by Constantine. <clears throat> he did a lot of stuff. Him integrating him integrating many Roman theologies and ideologies have produced is is a lot of the inauguration, a lot of the 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 beginnings of the false religious structure that modern-day Christianity has become. It stems from Constantine. <clears throat> many, of the, many, of the, many of the traditions of men that have been implemented, that have been erected, that have been perpetuated for centuries now, a lot of them stem from Constantine and his merging of uh, church and politics or church and state. <clears throat> you can do your own research in regards to what he has done. As many of us know, many of the pagan holidays, linking it to Christmas and all these things, it was it came from Constantine, him merging pagan pagan practices and mixing it in Christianity because Christianity became the the, the, the religion of that time. And so, in order to appease everybody, Constantine merged Roman paganism, Roman cultures, <clears throat> with Christianity. But unfortunately, not only did the pagan holidays come in. But also even traditions, even the very way we listen to sermons. I'm not going to go there. Nevertheless, this chasm or distinction between uh, clergy and laity has been quite has become too wide, and it has led to. As I'm, to, as I'm going to get to, many, um, well, overall, holistically, as I already said, it has led to the, the rest of the development that the church finds itself in. Again, as I said, many believe that their, 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 their calling is to simply go to church, put in their offering or whatever, and go home. That is what has been, that is, it is programming. It is religious programming. Some, some of them believe that their call in life is to is to is to is to um, support the man of God's vision. That's their calling. That's their ordination. Many leaders will perpetuate that. Many, and that, though, as I'm going to get to, that is the indications of a cult. A leader who tells his congregants that their 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 destiny, 
their their scroll is to service his vision. That is, those are the rudiments of a cult. No leader should say that. Any leader who does say that, it is an indication that they are false and that they're a cult leader. And there are those who say this, blatantly so. Like John Anosike, like Catherine Crick. <clears throat> they mix in their pseudo uh, uh, disingenuous sermons and teachings. Oh, you're calling here and this and that. You have a calling, you have a great calling, but it takes patience. These are buzzwords and coded words for stay here and don't grow. Hopefully, no. Stay where you're blessed. Stay where. Uh, it's cult, in, cult um, infused sermons. If you have a discerning ear, you will hear it. Don't listen to other voices. Don't listen to anybody else. You, you, you listen to who's feeding you. you. You stay planted. That kind of talk, buzzards, you stay planted. You stay grounded. It's not in the context of the stay planted and grounded in the, the love of the Lord and in Scripture. It's staying planted to them. <clears throat> now, there is a danger in having many voices. No, most certainly. For balance here, there's a danger in listening to everybody else. Once you find an individual who is feeding you appropriately, it is, it can be detrimental to you if you have many voices you're listening to. Most certainly, don't get me wrong and hear me in balance, but the manner and the intentions and the, the context by which these cult leaders are saying it is not from that place of concern. It's more of a place for self-preservation and ensuring that these people don't leave them. And if you leave this anointing, you'll be cursed. All these kind of things are what lend credence to this chasm where people are not, leaders are not Discipling people to maturity, they're, 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 they're procuring themselves followers, fans, idolaters, and cultists. What perpetuates this very large chasm. So, but before I get into that, to close off here, because I'm not going to be very long, I want to provide some balance in terms of the importance, and I already made reference to some, I already made reference to another uh, part of balance here, and that is in regards to not forsaking the assembling of us together. The gatherings are important. And a gathering is not germane or exclusive only to a, a church building. No. There's home fellowships. House fellowship is as house fellowship, brothers and sisters, is as legitimate as a church building. It's not about the place, it's about the gathering of the people. That is what makes church. Not a building, not an edifice. It is the gathering of the saints that makes something church. Where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. The Lord didn't say gather in a building, gather in a church edifice. No, the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in my name only, there I am. So the gathering of the saints constitutes the church. That is where church is formed, where two or three are gathered in like-mindedness in the name of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. That is when church is established and is being facilitated and administrated by two or three gathering together, right? <clears throat> that is a church, not a building, not an edifice. A house fellowship is as legitimate as a church edifice, most certainly, right? So, <clears throat> establishing that part of the balance. That this does this not this is not a negation of forsaking the assembly and coming together to gather. And also, this is not this what I'm about to read here does not also negate the importance of honoring elders, honoring those in leadership. Because again, people will use these religious infrastructures that are very true to come against to come against authorities, to come against submission to authorities, and that is Jezebelic. That is Jezebelic. That is demonic. We are to honor those in leadership positions, not only in the body of Christ, but even in government. <clears throat> As I will read here to establish balance before I begin to address the issue here, right? So to read here, it's for balance here. Hebrews 13, verse 17, King James. Obey them that have rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for they watch over your soul. So in this context, it is of course in referring to leadership in the body of Christ, to leadership in Yahweh's house. Again, we're not to be rebels. And again, Jezebels and others are using the, the religious infrastructure and its falseness to, to establish or to perpetuate rebellion.
though there's a white chasm, though there is a, 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 a religious infrastructure that is false, that has been erected, that doesn't negate the, the importance of honoring those in leadership positions. Not only in the, again, as that's not only in the body of Christ, but in your in your in the world at large. Now, of course, if someone in a leadership position asks you to do something that is contrary to what you have heard, right, then you have to make a decision. And again, like in Nantu, what we're going to get into as far as eschatology, not what we're going to get into now, but I'm saying what we're going to end up eventually facing as far as the Antichrist and the beast system, right? You have a choice to make. So we honor them until there's a choice to be made in regards to your, your, your allegiance to the Lord. Then you have to make a choice. But outside of that context, we are to obey them that will have rule over us. The government, and in this context, leadership in the, in, in the local assemblies, the local ecclesias. We must honor leadership. We must honor leadership. It is an ordinance. It is a charge. There's never an excuse for rebellion. But again, in balance, because there are those who use this concept, like cult, it, cult leaders, to rule over their people, which I'm going to get to. <laughs> so that's, but I wanted to establish this balance as far as honoring leadership. It's important, and it is necessary. It is an ordinance, but it's not to be abused, which I'm going to get to. But I want to establish this balance of, of the importance of honoring leadership, submitting to authorities, particularly, of course, in the house of Yahweh, but ex holistically speaking, of course, government. We are to be law-abiding citizens. We are to be in the world as law-abiding citizens. We're not of the world as far as adhering to their traditions, their hedonism. No. Right? So, for they watch over your souls. Again, this is not covering. Again, this is not the false doctrine of coverings. Again, we are, we are leaders in Yahweh's house, particularly leaders of local assemblies, are watchers. They're guardians. They watch over you. It's not a covering. As it's as it's perpetuated and as it as it is taught in charismatic Pentecostal circles. That is a false doctrine. As it's taught. There's a covering aspect that is actually very genuine, but there's a covering aspect that is being taught, perpetuated in charismatic Pentecostal circles that is false. It's false. I'm not going to get into it. I've said it many times. But in the context here, what I'm reading here, leaders in local assemblies are watchers. They're guardians. Right? They have a responsibility to watch over the souls of men. That's what I'm saying. Leadership, when, you, Yahweh, when Yahweh authentically gives you a leadership position in this house, you become a watcher. You become a steward of souls. And that is why your, your judgments and your appraisals are very stringent. Let me turn the. I'm already getting. <laughs> yeah, well, brothers and sisters, my apologies. That is why. That is why our um, appraisals, brothers and sisters, as leaders, is very stringent. It's not a joke and it's not a game. We are assessed by the manner in which we, the manner in which we steward the souls of men. That is why. <clears throat> When Yahweh entrusts you with the souls of men to steward, he holds you accountable for them. And you'll be appraised accordingly as a result. But again, in context, in terms of this balance here, those of, those of us holistically are to honor, to submit to authorities in the body of Christ. Right? We submit to them. Now, of course, if a leader is acting out of pocket... <laughs> Particularly one that is, and this is, uh, not to get into it, but I already posted it this morning in regards to Chris Reed. And his, mis is his misconduct and his indiscretion. He has stepped down. He's another one. Yahweh is cleaning house, brothers and sisters. It's not a joke and it's not a game. I said, the Lord said, that victims are going to begin to come forward. And testify what has been done to them. This young lady, well, not this young lady, but Catherine here, a dear lady, Yahweh bless her, Yahweh strengthen her. She came forth to testify of what Chris Reed was doing to her when she was younger.
Chris Reed is well known. He has stepped down from Morningstar. It's happening, brothers and sisters. Again, this is a long time ago. Yahweh gives grace for you to repent and own up and be accountable for your actions. This happened years ago. And it's coming out only now. The grace window has expired. He gives all of us space to repent. Again, in balance, there are those who don't believe in judgment. They're in error. Then there are those who only talk about judgment. They're in error. Yahweh's love is comprised of four faces, as I said. Justice, judgment, grace, and mercy. And if you and if you if and and the manner in which you, you represent his love is conditional by reason of you including those four faces. Without those four faces, if you only do two, you're in error. Must be all four. So there are those who's given years to repent out of his grace, and they have chosen not to, and so therefore he will judge them. He will expose that which they've done. In so many cases, not to not to humiliate them, but to to to, to as a last ditch effort. To entreat them to repentance. Because there are those who will never repent unless they're exposed. There are those that Yahweh knows will never repent unless they're exposed. So that is why he does it. He doesn't expose to humiliate. That is what the adversary does. Yahweh exposes to redeem, to entreat repentance. Because again, as I said, there are those who will never repent. They're too prideful until they're exposed. When they're exposed, then they will repent. <clears throat> so as they they being leaders continuing Hebrews 13 17 they being leaders must give account they may do it with joy the right heart posture the right disposition of heart with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you so the next scripture for balance here 1 Peter 5 Verse 5 to 6 in the King James, it reads, Likewise, the younger, submit yourself unto the elder. We honor our elders. Most certainly, hear me in balance. Honor is needed. Honor is an ordinance. There are many things that you will never walk into unless you have honor. But again, there are those who abuse that context to, to turn into extreme honor. That is, become idolatry. But again, that doesn't negate the truth of honor. There are things that many of us will never walk into because we don't honor people. Honor is a doorway into... The honor is one, another doorway into many things. I don't want to get into it. <clears throat> but nevertheless, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder. There are those of us oh, who are irreverent to elders. We don't honor elders. We don't honor our elders. That is a plague of younger generations, and particularly this generation. There's a lack of honor for our elders. It's not right. But again, it can be can become perverse. We're in extreme honor, where we believe an elder is is absolved, or infallible, or cannot be corrected, and that is error. That is what it ventures into perversion. It must be in balance. So you honor your elders, but that doesn't mean that they're, you honor them to the point where they're absolved or infallible or um, exempt from appraisals and from correction. No! That is what becomes error. But the balance is we are to honor elders. Submit to the elders. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. We humble ourselves, we submit to our authorities. Whether at work, your boss, or at church, your leadership. <clears throat> for balance, before I address the, the chasm. So, for God resisted the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So you notice we often quote that scripture here. The context of that scripture is in regards to submission. To authority. As I said, there are things you will never walk into, as far as grace is concerned, until you submit, until you <clears throat> learn to honor. So we often quote that part. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. But the context in which Cephas is saying it is in regards to submitting to eldership. Honoring your elders, submitting to authorities. 
There are things that will never be released to you in terms of grace, in other words, until you learn to submit, until you honor. <clears throat> that is a true ordinance. But again, there are those, particularly in Africa, who've abused it. So, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of Yahweh, that he may exalt you in due time. So you see the context. Part of your exaltation is humility, and humility within the context of submitting to authorities. Many times, as far as your process in your syllabus, y'all will have you submit to other leaders. Before you become a leader, you must learn to you must learn to follow. Part of your syllabus to become a leader is you must learn to submit. You must learn to follow. That is a common pattern, a common syllabus for many leaders. They must first learn to follow. They must first learn to serve. They must first learn to submit. If you cannot submit, you cannot be a leader. Before you're given, before you're conferred authority by Yahweh, you must first learn to submit to authority. Without that, you will never be given authority. Never. You resist the proud within that context. Yahweh will never give you authority until you learn to submit to authority. Even so, authorities that are mean to you, Yahweh will test you. How do you respond to a leader, particularly at work, but it can't even be at church, but particularly at work? Your boss at work gives you a hard time. What do you do in response to that? Do you gossip about them? Do you slander them with your coworkers? Join the coworkers, slander your boss. Or you don't do your work as you ought to. Yeah, I will test you. Those are things that, that are part of your syllabus. That is a module for your syllabus, learning to submit. If you cannot do that, Yahweh will not promote you. Yahweh will not confer authority upon you. He will not exalt you in due time. We often quote these verses and not understand the true context of what, what Sivas is saying. Exaltation comes by way of humility, and the humility that you garner or that you close yourself with comes by reason of your willingness to submit to authority, to serve, to honor. So, thank you, Lord. So, see this again, 1 Peter 2 this time, verse 13, 13 to 20 in the Amplified, very quickly here. Submit yourselves to the authority of every human institution for the sake of the Lord, to honor his name, in brackets, whether it, whether it is to a king as one in a position of power, like, a, again, the government, the president, the president, your politician, not politician, excuse me, the president, uh, 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 a municipal or federal leader, whatever the case may be, right? Here in Canada is a premier or prime minister, right? So, or to governors as sent by him to bring punishment to those who do wrong and to praise and encourage those who do right. For it is the will of Yahweh that, that by doing right you may, be si you may silence, muzzle or gag, the culpable ignorance and irresponsible criticisms of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover or pretext for evil. But use it and live as Yahweh, excuse me, as bond servants of Yahweh. Show respect for all people. Treat them honorably. Honor. Love the brotherhood. Fellow believers, of course. Fear Yahweh. Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect. Not only to those who are good and kind, but also to those who are unreasonable. Again, Yahweh will test us. How do you submit to your boss at work? They're not treating you right. Do you complain? Do you murmur? Do you gossip? Do you slander them? Do you backbite against them? Do you, are you tardy in your work? Yahweh will test you. What is your response? This is a chart. This is prescriptive. You don't, you don't only honor those and submit to those who are good, but those who are unjust. Sometimes I will have you there. Some of us want to want to change jobs because our boss is a tyrant to us, not knowing y'all is using that as a syllabus, as a module to teach you humility, because he wants you to be a great leader. So he must put you through that. 
Because great leaders were, were, were first followers, were first servants. Great leaders were first great followers. Great leaders were first great followers. So part of your syllabus for your ordination as a leader in Yahweh's house, he will put you through that. <laughs> anyway, where am I here? Um, for this find, for this, for this finds favor. If a person endures the sorrow of suffering unjustly, there's a blessing behind it. How do you respond when a boss is treating you unfairly? I mean, you're still doing right. You're still being righteous. There's favor behind it. If a person endures a sorrow of suffering unjustly because of an awareness of the will of Yahweh, after all, what kind of credit is there if when you do wrong and are punished for it, you endure patiently? What's the, what's the reward in that, right? But if when you do what is right and patiently bear, patiently bear undeserved suffering, this finds favor with Yahweh. Hallelujah. So, that's the balance. Now, to get to the, the, the chasm here, and the, what this chasm has done. There's some bullet points here before I close here and read the scriptures, the, the scripture witnesses to, this, to, the, to the issue of leadership in the body of Christ. So, this chasm has produced idolatry, as I've already said, and has perpetuated idolatry, where a person believes that their call in life is to serve a man of God. They don't have any call of their own. They have no ordinate. They have no ordination of their own. They have no school of their own. Their sole purpose is to serve the man of God and his vision. That is a lie. Now we're not we're not rebels, but everyone must find out their scroll. And, and what is written on your scroll is not to perpetually serve a man of God. Again, as I already just said, as far as balance, you're serving a man of God can be a part of your syllabus. Not could be is a part of your syllabus to teach you servanthood to teach you. How to be a great follower in order for you to become a great leader. So part of your syllabus, en, en route to your ordination as a leader on, in your own right, is to serve, is to, be, to honor your elders. <clears throat> right? But unfortunately, this chasm has produced idolatry. Where people are flocking to a person who prophesies and has gifts, has manifestations. And will bloody defend them even when they're in error. Will bloody defend a witch or a warlock who's in error. Will go in people will go in people's comments on social media and defend them. Let them know them. It is idolatry. <laughs> Glorying in a gift that you yourself can walk in, just the same. Again, you may not be called to the office of a prophet or an apostle or whatever. But you're called to be a son, and a son can hear from Yahweh just as clearly as any prophet can. I hope you know. A son can hear from the Lord as clearly as a prophet can. I hope you know. Don't let anybody fool you, brothers and sisters. Hear me very carefully. A son can hear from Yahweh as clearly and even more so as, as any prophet can. This is what I'm saying. That this, this is what perpetuates the chasm. There, it, uh, believers are not being taught this. The Lord said... My sheep hear my voice. Not my prophets. The Lord said, My sheep hear my voice. And a stranger, they will not follow. He didn't say my prophets. Everyone who was a member of the new covenant, who has received Yeshua HaMashiach as the Lord and Savior, has access to the preceding word. Meaning that they can hear from their father as clearly as any prophet can by reason of their maturity, by reason of their sonship. But it's not being taught. Prophets, are true prophets anyway, are not teaching this. And false prophets are perpetuating idolatry by drawing people to them out of a gift, out of a pseudo-gift, for that matter. This is what perpetuates the large chasm. Part of the, part of the intentions of Yahweh is that leaders are to raise other leaders. That a lay member is, 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 is not to be a lay member in terms of doing nothing. They're to be grown to stature, whereby the differences between them and a leader is very small. Again, it's, they're still the leader of the local assembly, but a person that they have discipled has come to a point of stature wherein, if they so desire, the leader can say, hey, I want you to preach a sermon. 
Now, of course, in tradition, only those who have been ordained by the by the governing bodies can actually do. Well, that's not actually true either. That's not true either. That's not true either. You see, I have to be careful. <clears throat> The governing body can give anybody an opportunity to, to preach a sermon or to give an exhortation. Male or female, by the way. That's the balance of the female. Again, as I said, males and females are equal in the spirit. A, a female can give an exhortation, most certainly. But for her to lead a local assembly, that is illegal. That does not mean that she cannot give an exhortation to, to, to relay what as Yahweh has placed upon her heart. Again, for balance. But again, social media and its blurred lines and muddy waters have blurred these lines where women are coming online illegally and prophesying and teaching men. But that does not mean that a woman cannot give an exhortation in a local assembly, given the discretion of the governing bodies. <clears throat> so I have to correct myself. You see? <laughs> the governing body can ask a person who is not necessarily ordained to give a sermon. Or to have a sermonette or a series of people giving what with what respect upon the heart. Again, that kind of thing is is the traditions of men. Only those who are damned can give a sermon. That's not true. That's the tradition of men. Where in the Bible does it say that? Where is scripture for that? The only those who are who've been ordained by the governing body, the local governing body, are the only ones that can give a sermon. Where in, where in the Bible does it say that? It's nowhere to be found. That is, a, that is a tradition of men. Now, of course, the leadership who, the leadership of the local body, are the ones primarily the ministers, primarily the ones who give the sermon. That does not mean that a person cannot be given the opportunity to give a sermon. That is nowhere to be found in Scripture. The only those of the clergy can give sermons. That is not true. That's that's a tradition of men. Nowhere can you find that in Scripture. Nowhere. That is nowhere to be found in Scripture. That only those who are ordained as ministers who've been who receive the certificate can give sermons. That is a tradition of men. That is a tradition of men. That is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Nowhere. See, so I had to correct myself. <laughs> <clears throat> there are traditions that have been ingrained in us that are not found in scripture they're not anyway this also produces codependent relationships which lends to the arrest of development where we depend upon the leader and there are those again who are, who are fanatics who are idolaters who only depend upon the prophet for, the, for direction that is, that is codependency and that is the arrest of development we cannot be codependent upon a leader for direction, no. That is why this chasm is this chasm exists. That is where this chasm exists. <clears throat> Codependency. You rely on the prophet or the apostle for direction. That is idolatry. You have access to the preceding word. You must be able to hear from your father yourself. But that's what the purpose of leadership is, to supplement that and to guide you also. Right? There, there are watches over you. See, so of course, divide direction, the divine, they, they provide guidance. That's the purpose of leadership in local assemblies is for to provide guidance, to provide direction, to provide counsel. In the multitude of counsels, there is safety. However, though, they're not to be your they're not to be your sole source of direction and instruction. No. That's codependence and that is error. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And of course, that's why Chasm, as I already alluded to, uh, produces cults. Where you have doctrines like touched up my anointed. And nobody profits no harm. You, can, you dare not speak against the man of God. You dare not speak against the woman of God. Or else you'll, you'll be judged. Or else you'll die. You dare not leave the church. You dare not leave that local assembly unless, unless you be cursed. That's betrayal. <clears throat> the 
that the leader has some kind of special relationship with the Lord that you can never have. That's cult-like behavior, that this particular prophet or apostle or leader has a special relationship with the Lord that you can never have. We follow this leader because he's special and you're not. That's cult-like behavior. When a man is placed on a pedestal above, the, again, that is, that's, that is perpetuating a very large chasm between the clergy and the laity. That is error. And that's what produces cults. And I already said this part about uh, raising leaders, not raising leaders, but raising fans, followers and idolaters. And saying that those of the, the clergy of distinctive gifts that laity do not have, that is error. The, the, the anointing that is placed upon a leader is for service, and the ones that is placed upon the members is for um, is for worship. That 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 is nowhere to be found in Scripture. Nowhere. Now, there's particular graces that are afforded to those are the fivefold, of course, to render service. As far as um, that is part of their packaging. That does not mean that it is, is exclusive to them. For an example, an apostle, a true apostle, is grace with the ability to release graces. And of course, a prophet is very, part of his packaging, he's very, he or she, prophet, is, because um, there are female prophets, <laughs> for balance. There are those who don't believe that. That's not true. Right? I'm not going to go there. But nevertheless, um, see, I lost my train of thought. Sort of. <laughs> so there are yes, thank you, Lord. So there are giftings that are exclu not exclusive, but are pertinent to an office because they're needed to function. That doesn't mean that it's only exclusive to them. So in other words. A prophet will often flow very strongly in word of knowledge and word of wisdom and discerning of spirits. That is often what is attributed to their packaging or their, their utility belt, if it were, as it were. But those giftings are not, again, the offices, the five foot offices will flow in the manifestations of the work of Kadesh. But that doesn't mean that, they're, they're, that they're those, those manifestations are only accessible by five foot ministers. Again, that's the deception. That is the lie. Five foot officers will, will have unique um, a unique utility bill that affords them access to those gifts that is germane to their office right now of course an apostle flows in all of the gifts and they flow often all of the, the all of the um, well just all of the gifts because that's needed for them why because they are builders and so therefore they must release the, they must activate these things in you so apostles true apostles will often have all things functioning with them because they need to, to be able to release grace. Graces upon people, right? That is the purpose of an apostle. They are to release graces and activate you in your giftings. That is what a true apostle does. They don't just uh, become an idol, an idol, a cult leader. No, true apostles activate you in your ordinations and release and release graces upon you. That's what the apostle Paul said to, in regards to Timothy. Serve the gift that was laid upon you. I, and the apostle says, I, I, I earnestly desire that I may come in and activate gifts in you. Lay my hands on you and, I, and release gifts. <clears throat> that is a true apostle. Part of their packaging is in a tremendous gift of impartation. Because it is required for them to uh, uh, particularly establish a church. In their itinerant journeys, they must be able to release graces upon the people there to build a church. To establish leadership in that church and then leave there. That's true apostleship. An ability to have a tremendous grace of impartation to release graces and, rele and activate people in their callings and build them so that they can then run a church. That is a true apostle. A tremendous gift of impartation. But it comes with their packaging. So if you are an apostle for 20 years 
and you have not raised an individual who can replace you, know that you're in error. You're indicted. If you are, you call yourself an apostle, and you've been in, a, in, in an apostleship for 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, and you have not raised an individual who can replace you, you're an heir. You're indicted. So. So the anointings that Fafu and ministers will flow in are not germane to them. It is required for them. It is a requisite. For them to render service. But that doesn't mean that those gifts are, are exclusive to them. That is a lie, as I already explained. So there's no so to make a distinction, a, a white, a, to establish a chasm between all oh, an apostle flows in gifts that, a, that, a, that a, a lay member can never flow in. That is that is that is not according to scripture. That is incorrect theology. That is a lie. <laughs> so And I already, I already referenced, rendered, rendered service bears the biggest fruit as a leader, whereby or in, you're, you have built a disciple or someone to, to a capacity that can replace you. That is a true mark in the apostle, but also leaders at large. True leader, true leaders, excuse me, birth leaders. True leaders, birth leaders. So if you... Again, I've been in leadership in the body of Christ for a number of years, 20 years, 15 years. And you can't point to somebody and say, hey, that person I raised. And they can't walk in the same measure as you walk in or higher. Know that you have failed. Know that you're indicted by Yahweh. Hope you know. And again, this is what lends to the indictment of David E. Taylor and Joshua Selman. These two men are prototypes of this era. The old era, the old guard, the old wineskin. Of the one-man superstar celebrity ministers, they 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 cannot bring before Yahweh a one man who they can say, "Hey, this person walks in the same measure as I do, and or higher." They can't. That's cult-like behavior. And Catherine Crick and John Nosiki are falling along that same line. Of cult leaders. <laughs> so, the true mark of a leader is the leaders is the leaders that they have raised, and in this context, a leader who, who walk in the, who's walking in the same stature or higher that they are. They can give them the whole week to preach sermons or to minister in the spirit. And they'll flow in, they'll flow in as anointed as they have, or as they are. Where are those you've raised? So someone like false apostle uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Ferguson will have his video, will post videos of him laughing with his followers in narcissistic behavior. I tell you, man. Receiving a narcissist feeds off the affirmation of others and the praise and the worship of others. That's, that's that narcissistic trait. So you have men like him and others who, who, who go hum, humble, uh, uh, will congregate amongst his, amongst his followers and speak all kinds of things and have them go, wow, oh, how deep, go deep, go deep. It's all a matter of self-aggrandizement. It's cult-like behavior. It's narcissistic behavior. True, true gatherings are, 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 hallelujah. A true leader, not only, um, how can I word this in balance? The Apostle Paul said, we speak things, we speak mature things with those who are mature. So there are things, of course, that you will not necessarily talk about in terms of the spirit world and the spirit reality, spiritual realities, but those of your followers, your disciples, necessarily. But you should be able to have a conversation with your disciples, and you, you, they relate things to you, and you relate, you relate things to them, things that they're experiencing, things that you're experiencing, 
Not about a, 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 a video of self-aggrandizement where you're releasing uh, supposed mysteries and everybody's clapping you and singing your praises. That's not a leader. <clears throat> you should be able to gather amongst your disciples and you guys, you guys interchange what they're encountering, what you're encountering, and you can bounce, you can bounce off each other, and you provide them counsel. They'll come to you. You will gather together with your disciples and say, "Hey, they'll tell you what they're experiencing, their encounters, and what you're always teaching them." And then you'll you'll provide counsel and balance and leadership and and, and accountability to what they're experiencing. That's a true gathering of disciples. As the Lord, as it is described in Scripture, Lord, we cast out those in your name. And the Lord said, of course, Behold, I saw Satan fall from heaven, but rejoice not. Be able to cast out those who rather rejoice that your names are written in the book of heaven. Right? But nevertheless, the principle is still there that the disciples are going back to the Lord saying, Hey, look what we're doing, Lord. We're casting out devils. The demons are obeying our name. Sorry, the demons are 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 are, are, list, are obeying us in your name. So the Lord didn't necessarily rebuke them. He just provided counsel and said, "Hey, that's great, but don't rejoice in that, though, right?" So that's an example of what I'm talking about here. It's not about self-aggrandizing amongst a leader. Oh, come coming together and them them singing your praises in a video. Go deeper, Papa. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that deep? Yeah, Papa, that's great. What is that? <clears throat> Again, it perpetuates the chasm. That's not leadership. So, where am I here? It's already read that about a superstar celebrity. He's Saifara. Nimari Sifentora. Holy Ghost confirming. So, the scriptures here to close. John 13, 12 to 20. It reads as follows here. And this is, of course, the balance of a true leader. Again, Yeshua Hamashiach is the protocol. He's the example. He's the pattern man. He is the firstborn through which other replicas are made. We are, be, we are to be conformed to his image. So, he provides the blueprint. And again, as I said, the Apostles' Doctrine that largely comprises the syllabus of Yeshua HaMashiach is the teachings that we adhere to. And one of the modules that he has in his syllabus is servanthood. That is a module, a very important module. And I'll read some of the scriptural witnesses that go with that module. So one of them, of course, is the washing of the feet. So, John 13, verse 4 to 20 in the King James. So after he had washed their feet, he being the Lord, of course... And had taken his garments and was set down again. He said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? The Lord is asking them, Do you know what I have done here? Do you know what it means? Do you know what it signifies? My disciples. Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, Well, for so am I. So I am. Hallelujah. Honor you, Lord Jesus. Honor you, Yeshua. You call me master and lord. Those are two different things. Master for in, in reference to a rabbi. Lord is of course referring to Lord. Right? So Yeshua is making clear that yes, you call me rabbi and you call me Lord, and so I am. And he said that for a reason, because a rabbi, if you're submitting to a rabbi, you follow what he does. Part of your goal is to become like your rabbi. He's your pattern. So he's saying that, yes, you call me rabbi. And you have said, well, so what I'm about to do here, you are to mimic it. I'm showing you a pattern of disposition of heart by this act of humility. I'm demonstrating. I am demonstrating the correct disposition of heart that you are to have as a leader. So, and you say, well, for so I am. Hallelujah. If I then, your Lord and Master, wash your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an, ex an example, the Lord says, that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. 
Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. The Lord is, the Lord is saying a lot here. If ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I am, who I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. Of course, he's referencing, of course, Judas. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Judas must betray him. And that's a whole other kind of worm. There's a lot, there's a lot of things that are deeper in regards to Judas. I'm not going to get into. There's a lot to him. Nevertheless, the scriptures may be fulfilled, right? Again, like I said, the Lord's, the Lord's life on earth was meticulously and, and meticulously and sovereignly fulfilled and um, prophesied about. It was according to a prophecy that was absolute, that was according to sovereignty, right? <clears throat> Nevertheless, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me, of course, Judas. Now I tell you before it come that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, sorry, he that receiveth himsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And there's a lot to that. When you receive a leader, in the name of the Lord, you receive the Lord. But again, there are those who have used that principle to establish credence to curse people. Oh, if you don't listen to what I'm saying, Yah will curse you. That is error. <clears throat> it's twisting of scriptures. But anyway, next scripture witness, Matthew 15, verse 3 to 9, in the King James. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye see also such injustice? So this is, of course, him rebuking the Pharisees for, for their disposition of heart. So, you, so the Lord, Yeshua, told to explain to his disciples by his act of washing feet, the correct disposition of heart you are to have as a leader. Now here, he's going to describe the incorrect and erroneous disposition of heart you are to have as a leader by rebuking the Pharisees, as we know here. So Matthew 50, verse 93 to 9, in the King James, it reads, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of Yahweh by your tradition? For, for Yahweh commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, shall be, he shall be free. So in context here, the Lord was addressing these Pharisees who were saying that they are, they are, they're going to give an offering. They, were, they, they would rather offer an offering to the Lord in adherence to that law than honor their mother and their father by giving them that, giving them that gift. So, so for an example, if your mother or your father is in need, and you refuse to give them, you refuse to help them by reason of you obeying a law or obeying, an, an, uh, uh, obeying a law of an offering, then you've erred. You've erred. The one that your parents are in need, and rather than you helping them, you take that which you, you have, because you do have the, you have the resources to help them, but rather than helping them, you take that which you have and offer it to the Lord as a gift or as an offering and say, oh, I'm obeying this. He's saying, you're honoring a commandment, but, in, but you, you're, honor, you're uh, honoring it and obeying it in error. It is, you're, you're honoring a tradition by reason of you offering in a way whereby you are not adhering to the commandment of honoring your parents. <clears throat> so that can be error. <laughs> There's a lot to that, I don't have time, so... Thus have ye made the commandment of Yahweh of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah, being Isaiah, of course, prophesied of you, saying, This is what these people draweth me unto me, but with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And the reason why I'm referencing this is because there are, there are traditions that people have taught that are not scriptural. That have been used as a reason to perpetuate idolatry. They've used traditions of men to, per to perpetuate idolatry and also perpetuate this white chasm that exists 
between members of the clergy, members of the laity, traditions. Traditions. Next scripture, Mark 10, verse 14 to 20. Sorry, Mark 10, verse 42 to 45 in the King James. But Yeshua called to them and said unto them, You know that they are which are counted to rule over Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. No, this is the this is the, probably the core scripture here. Mark 10, verses 42 to 45 in the King James. It reads, But Yeshua called unto him, sorry, called them, them being the disciples, to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Listen very carefully. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. That is the context. The Lord is saying, you are you 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 have been given a seat of a leadership over over my sheep. However, though, you are not to use that, that seat as an occasion to lord over your people. And that is part of the problem that has perpetuated this large chasm where leaders are lording themselves over a congregants and over members. That they think they're over here and their members are down here, and that is not how it works. That is an incorrect disposition of heart to have as a leader. And that is why he, 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 he demonstrated that act of washing their feet. <coughs> You're not up here and your members are down here. That is, that is a tradition of men. <coughs> As I'm going to read with the, with the, with the Pharisees, when you rebuke them. <coughs> like Catherine Crick, having her members bow at her feet, even men. Even having men bow at her feet. It is treason. It is just a ballot. Having men bow at her feet. Having men bow at her feet in honor. Having men bow at her feet. It's just a bellic. It's treason. Honoring her, quote unquote. And that's what I'm saying. There's an extreme honor that exists amongst many churches that has brought about this white chasm. It is a perverse honor. It is idolatry. But again, as I said already, it is not given for Nisha to rule a local assembly, to establish government over a local assembly because there are men there. It is not given for an Isha to exercise headship over a man. It doesn't matter what anybody wants. It doesn't matter what, what, what Jezebels want to say. It doesn't matter how they want to fight this. It doesn't matter what modern-day feminism wants to say. The scriptures are clear, and the scriptures cannot be broken. So for her to allow and to incite and perpetuate men in her church Bowing at her feet in honor, she's indicted. She's guilty of high treason. <clears throat> so, leaders are never to use their position of leadership or seat of leadership as an occasion to exercise lordship over them, to lord it over them like a tyrant. Right? So, so the Lord is saying here that let that kind of disposition of heart not be named among you, my disciples. That is not the pattern. As he's going to read, continuing here. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister or your servant. And whosoever you, whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. That is the pattern. The higher you go, the more certain you are to become. No more of a tyrant. The higher you go in Yahweh, the more certain you are to become to his people. So the higher you go, the lower you, you are to bow in service. That you render. The higher you go. <clears throat> the higher you go in Yahweh, the less you are to be in terms of <clears throat> your resultation before men. You are their servants, not their master. Within the context of a ruler 
You are to serve. You rule as a servant. You don't rule as a tyrant. And your rulership is not ruling over them. It's a leadership position as a servant. So, for even the Son of Man, the Lord says, continuing, came not to be ministered unto, rather to be served, but to be min to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the pattern. No greater love than no greater love than this. You lay down your life for your for your brothers. Service. <clears throat> to close here. Matthew 23, verse 2 to 12. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moshe's seat. This is the rebuke. All therefore, whatsoever they bid your bid you, will also all therefore, whatsoever they bid you, whatever they tell you to do, you observe it, you do it. Then observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. And many leaders are like this. They say and they do not. They talk about service. They talk about honor. They talk about all these things. Yet they don't do it. They're tyrants. For they bind heavy burdens. They talk about service as it relates to people serving them. Not them serving the people. So they say but they do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born. Again, they, they become taskmasters. And again, they say they, they propagate to their, their congregants that their role in the house is to serve their vision. So they place the burden of all the administrative work, all these things are, are to serve them the leader, the tyrant, the cult leader. And, and the, the, the cult leader will work them tooth and nail. I don't want to get into it. I'm very tempted to. You know, there are some things that are being alleged in regards to David E. Taylor. As far as his treatment of his staff. Now, there are things that are for all to see as far as his, his disposition of heart towards them. His disrespect of them. His, 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 his disdain towards them. His quote-unquote correction towards them. Publicly, while ministering. Very rude. Very tyrannical. Very disrespectful. Very demeaning. That's not the heart of the Lord. It's not... Nonetheless, I'm not going to go there. Let me stop. So, just to, for me to say that. So, um, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And in this context, they're tight suits. They're Gucci belts. They're expensive jewelry, like Pasin Java. <clears throat> and to a lesser degree, uh, Lovi Elias, flaunting their, 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 their monetary and their, their garments. <clears throat> and love the upper, uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Again, there are those who have a king chair in their churches where they sit. The mighty apostle have their king seat. Anyway. And greetings in the marketplace. And, and they love to be called. They, they love to be, and to be called of men. Rabbi, rabbi. They love titles. They love to be called papa and mama. And apostle and prophet. And they love their titles. It's still happening today. Men love their titles. Be, but be not called rabbi for one sorry for one is your master even Christ no in context there, there are those who would say and they would use the scripture as credence to come against the apostle Paul and say oh well the, the, the law like uh, false apostle Johnson Solomon who says that the that the Lord's words have potential to contradict with the apostle Paul's writings and if they do we adhere to the words of the Lord now this is one of the scriptures that they may use as credence for that to say that the apostle Paul talked about spiritual fathering but the, the, but, the, but the Lord says not to call anybody your father. What's I'm going to get to? But you must understand this in context. <clears throat> Spiritual fathering is very real. But in, in the context of which the Lord is saying here is an occasion where that is why he said that is why the context is provided in the preceding verses. As far as the disposition of heart. Using your authority to lord over people.
Now, the proper term would probably be probably be a more appropriately identified, or the moniker is spiritual mentor, not necessarily spiritual father, but spiritual mentor. But they are a father in the, in, in in the context of they're responsible for your discipleship and your growing in your in your walk in the spirit, much like a natural father is. Well, the error comes and you think that you're you're supposed to always be their covering. They're supposed to grow to a point where you bec they become your equal. They're no longer your 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 child, but they're your son or your daughter. So you're equals now. You become friends, like a natural father and mother come with their children. Eventually, they become friends. It's no longer a child, mother, or child father relationship. They become when your child is grown. It's supposed to become your friend. The, the, the relationship is supposed to change. It's supposed to migrate. Well, they're not your friend. They are equal now. Where you guys can communicate as equals. Though he's still your father, though she's still your mother, you guys communicate as equals because you're an adult now. Likewise, it is in the spirit. They're, not, they're always going to be your father. But you're not going to relate to them as, as your child for forever. Oh, you're, you're under my covering. That is false doctrine. <clears throat> So that's the context whereby the Lord is saying that they're, they're always, they're always going to be your father in the context of a mentor. But they're not, they're not to be called your father in terms of perpetually so. If you get what I'm saying, you're in context. They rear you to maturity. That's their responsibility. But it, it but it's for a season. Then, then they're to release into your ordination. Whatever that may be. Whether it's outside that local assembly or where it's in that local assembly. Who knows? That it's unique to you, right? It may, be, may very well be in that local assembly. Or it may very well, very well will not be. Maybe I will call you to start your own thing. Who knows? It's depending upon individuals. Uniquely so, right? The point is, they're to become your equals. Now, in context, we're all equals. What I mean by that is equals in responsibility. Because a babe in Christ won't necessarily be given the opportunity to give a sermon. They may give, if you have a children's day, for example, as an example, children's day, you have the children to you have the children to to conduct service, right? The young people, right? But perpetually speaking, you're not always gonna have <clears throat> the children give a sermon. No, <laughs> right? Of course not. So even a babe in Christ, you may give them the opportunity to give an exhortation, most certainly. But as far as them giving a sermon, or they're addressing the, 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 the holistic in a perpetual state or in a frequent state, that's not necessarily given to a babe in Christ. No. Because they're not, they're not grounded in the scriptures, nor are they grounded in the spirit. So you're not going to give them that opportunity. So I'm equals as far as responsibility, not equals as far as value. So hear me clearly here. I'm not talking about equals as far as Value equals it in terms of responsibility, right? That's my point. So, where am I here? Um, hope that makes sense. I'm trying to be as balanced as I can because I don't want to lend to the traditions of men, but also I don't want to negate the importance of process, of service, of maturity, right? It's important because there are those who hear things from their through the lens of their traumas. Not through the lens of their spiritual ears. So they will hear something and take it and run with it and not hear and not hear it in balance. But sometimes you can't help that, right? Anyway. Uh, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. So you see here, the apostle, sorry, the Lord Himself is establishing the equality here. All are brethren. That's the point. So he's saying that your position of leadership is not a position whereby you lord over people. You guys are equals. We're all brethren here. Even those, an apostle and you are brothers. There's no, again, this is part of the white chasm that we're talking about here. People in leadership positions, lording themselves and thinking themselves up here, and people are down here. The Lord is saying, <clears throat> the Lord is saying, we're all brethren. None of the leader, no matter the position. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It just so happens that a particular person has a seat of leadership. That doesn't mean they're better than you. It doesn't mean that they're over you, like higher than you. It means they're given a, a responsibility. 
We're all equals here. Nobody's better than anybody else. This is the point. The, 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 it's basically the theme of this, is of, this, of this video here. Nobody's better than anybody else. Everybody carries the same value. There's different responsibilities, most certainly. But everybody carries the same equality and value. We're all brethren here. Nobody's better than anybody else. To, to, so to use your seat of leadership to load over people is error. And, and it produces an erroneous chasm. So, and call on men your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Now again, imbalance here. That doesn't negate the, the truth concerning spiritual fathering, where someone will birth you in the spirit and raise you to maturity. He's not necessarily speaking against spiritual fathering. What he's talking about is the disposition of heart in regards to it. Within the context of how the Pharisees were acting. Right? But it's more appropriately actually said spiritual mentoring, not fathering. If we're going to, if we're going to um, stringently adhere to what they're saying here, it's more appropriately called spiritual mentoring. Or discipleship, spiritual discipleship, right? Because there are those who need to teach you. <laughs> That's the purpose of the fivefold. That was the purpose of the fivefold to teach you, to train you, to disciple you, to supplement, supplement your syllabus and your growth that you will have in your personal dealings with the Lord and with Yahweh, <clears throat> right? So it's more properly monikered perhaps spiritual mentorship or spiritual discipleship not necessarily spiritual fathering but that doesn't mean that that's it. using that term or that moniker is necessarily or inherently wrong because the apostle Paul said I am, I am your father I have birthed you in the spirit in regards to Corinthian church and he identified Timothy as his son and, t and Titus also so it's not contradictory as some would report it is <clears throat> right so, hope you understand, right? Spiritual fathering is a real thing. There are those that Yahweh will, 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 will send you to, to sit under, to learn from. To grow you to maturity. Then release you. Right? So. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is great among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So we see there to close that there's a wide chasm that exists in the body of Christ between clergy and laity, and that ought not to be so. We're all brethren here. Now, of course, we honor leaders. That's why I provided the balance at the beginning. We are to honor our leaders, honor our elders. But the chasm that exists now is erroneous. It's too wide. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone astray. It has, it's become too wide. And that has led to what I already had outlined as far as cultish behavior, cults, uh, idolatry, fanaticism, <clears throat> codependency, amongst other things that I already outlined. And so the Lord is saying, let us as a people, as a body of Christ, as a house of Israel, repent of this, particularly leaders, and understand and be reminded of, the, uh, understand and be reminded of what our seat is means for our responsibilities are concerned. That we're not to raise, that we are all brethren here. We're all equals. Nobody's better than anybody else. We're all equals. Though we have different responsibilities, we are all equals. Nobody's better than anybody else. And for you to, for you to perpetuate that by your sermons, by your teachings, by your messagings, by your, your, your sentiments, that is error. <clears throat> so leaders must repent for doing this and producing this white chasm. Father, I pray. I pray for those of leaders in the body of Christ who are humble enough to, to hear this and repent, that you will uh, create in them a clean heart, that you will heal them, deliver them, perhaps any deficits that they have or wounds that provided an opening for them to be, to believe this is the way it should be as far as leadership and governance in your house, Father, <clears throat> that we must remember that we're equals. Those of your children, Father, we're all equals here. Nobody's better than anybody else. We are all your children, we are all um, your people, Father. We're all equals here. And that we must treat each, treat each other 
accordingly as equals, but of course, also father and balance to honor those you've placed in your house in leadership positions. You have to honor them, submit to them, um, and submit to them. So it is as I've said, Father, as you've as you've spoken, as you've ordained, as you've sanctioned, and as I've delivered here. Be thou glorified in order name that we pray. In the name of your dear son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I didn't mean to, I didn't want to go this long, but nevertheless. Um, prayer was understood. I was try, I tried my best by Yahweh's grace to be in balance here. Right? Be in balance. So. Forgive and let go. Don't hold offense to anybody. It's not worth it. Don't give an indication for the adversary to accuse you before your father because he is accusing. And not going to offense is one of the primary means in which he accuses many of us. And unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. These are the things that he will often take before Yahweh to accuse you and therefore gain, gain access to your life. So if you stand before the Lord, excuse me, Yahweh made it, Yeshua made it clear that... <clears throat> If you do not forgive, Yahweh will not forgive you, that his forgiveness of you is contingent on you forgiving others. So we stand before the Lord at the end of the age, and you're yet in unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, and offense, you will go to hell. So your eternal security is not, excuse me, nothing and no one is worth your eternal security. So let it go. It's not worth it. Secondarily, as I said, let us pray the prayers of David. Search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew our spirit within me. It is our prayers. We have to pray on a daily basis, brothers and sisters, to protect us from pride. And again, as I said, it would defeat the purpose of you praying these prayers that, that when Yahweh begins to show you those things, whether through whether he himself or whether through others, like what I'm doing here or what I've been doing, that you respond in anger and offense. That you throw tantrums, you rant, you, you get angry and you get offended. Or you play victim and you start crying. Or you deflect. Or you posture. Or you project. An inability to be accountable for your errors and for your actions is pride. Pride isn't only about thinking you're better than anybody else. Like I said, as far as being a leader in the context of this broadcast, but also pride is your inability to humble yourself and receive correction, scrutiny, criticism. That is pride. And there are many there be who are pride in this area, especially women. <clears throat> but there are men too. They're prideful. They can't take correction. They can't take criticism and scrutiny. That is pride. <clears throat> so, when he shows you these things, whether himself or others, humble yourself and have them addressed. Amen. Lastly, to close, I've been saying, let us be mature, mature believers, as Hebrews five identifies, particularly Hebrews five fourteen, to not only be right, not only be skillful in the word of righteousness, but rightly dividing the word of truth, but also, excuse me. Discerning, testing, appraising the things that we hear, see, and watch, whether on a pulpit and especially on social media. That we are never to allow honor, affection, loyalty, um, affinity to dim, dull, compromise, hinder, or deter our discernment. And if that is the case that happens, that means that you're an immature. That means that you're a babe. And again, as I've been saying, no one and no one is exempt from appraisals. Not me or anybody. Anybody you listen to, me included, you take them before your father and you ask him about them, and he will show you. I'm not exempt. Nobody is. Don't be intimidated. People who are ranting and raving and saying, oh, you're, you're, you cannot question what they're saying and you can't question their prophecies. No, that is not from the Spirit of the Lord. No, that is not from the Holy Spirit. Everybody's, everybody's up for appraisals. Everybody is subject to appraisals. And everybody's prophecies, especially, are subject to appraisals. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody intimidate you. We're all subject to appraisals, brothers and sisters. We all are. So don't be fooled. Don't be intimidated. Amen? Amen. This is Gary. This is your brother, your servant. Gary saying, I love you dearly. Believe me, I do. All that I say, I say in love. This is the Minigate Ministries. And I'll be back as the Lord leads. Have an awesome rest of your week and your weekend. Shalom. 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 <laughs>